On this episode of the Ask an Artist podcast, we have Andrew Donahoe. Andrew is a Los Angeles-based filmmaker with a passion for storytelling from unique perspectives. He's also supported us from the beginning in our Kickstarter period, which is really awesome. Andrew's worked with some pretty notable artists, such as 21 Pilots, Bella Porch, Suburban, Skrillex, and Sir Paul McCartney. In this episode, we're going to cover the art of collaborative storytelling, so let's get to it. Hey everybody, Luke Thompson from Action VFX here. Uh, really excited about today's episode. We have a special guest joining us. I'm also co-hosting today with Rodolphe Pierre Louis, our founder and CEO of Action VFX. But our special guest is Andrew Donahoe. So, Andrew, welcome to this episode of Ask an Artist. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, really looking forward to diving into this chat. Uh, as you know, most of these uh, episodes are built around kind of like a single question that we'll ask and then unpack and you can take that whatever direction you'd like. But based on your background, uh, talking about the art of collaborative storytelling, how do you find yourself effectively collaborating with other artists as an artist yourself? Uh, So take that whichever way you'd like, but (laughs) whether that's directing or, you know, anything in between. Yeah, I mean, I think Filmmaking in general is something I was always drawn to because it is one of the only art forms where on the higher level of it, it can exist without a team. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Pretty much every traditional art form from photography to, to painting to music, there is a level of it that can exist in the higher end that is purely like one person or a small group um, or at least one person who's very much the lead. But filmmaking has always been really unique to me because it is something where it's like it's you need like an army to do things, especially mm-hmm. if we're talking like narrative storytelling on on a platform like a a large music video or a commercial or a movie obviously there's documentary and stuff like that on the side but yeah it's it's been something that's always appealed to me because you know i don't know how everyone else got into this field but for me it's like i started out you know doing like improv classes in high school and doing videos with friends and you know always doing like collaborative art projects and writing with people so i feel like you know, as I got deeper and deeper into things and through college and then and starting directing, it was always about like the people I could work with and that family mm-hmm. that you grow with. So I don't know. I think that's the, the best part of the entire process for me is that even if it's a client or an agency or a musician, just the fact that it is it is such an art form that is kind of like living and breathing with so many different people involved. That it, it always feels like larger than just yourself and it always feels like you can do more than you can do alone because you have such a massive team and such a a collaborative group of people working together. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for, but that's, <laughs> that's why filmmaking is special to me and why it's it's one of those art forms that, that really kind of breeds community. Yeah. No, that that's really cool to see. And even in that kind of answer right there, I think back to when you first got in touch with me, I think we had like mm-hmm. DM'd or something on Instagram Yeah. back when we were... I remember the specific moment because it was for a music video that you were working on at the time. Uh, I think it was for Vic Mensa. Mm -hmm. I remember that And yeah, so you were asking, there's like a specific plane breaking apart shot where he's kind of, you know, rapping as the planes diving uh, into the ocean. A really cool sequence. And then we were actually on set. I believe it was for our, we call it like our big January shoot. So like mm-hmm. coming out of the Kickstarter, we finally had funding to actually, you know, bring in power technicians and some really step up the scale. And so I remember being on set filming stuff. And I think we'd arranged for you to get like early access to some of the things that we were filming. But it was That'd so cool. Pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, because cause that was one moment where seeing that collaborative storytelling coming in just from uh, I think you were part of like our Kickstarter era that we had. Mm-hmm. And being able to be on set filming stuff, knowing, hey, this is how it's going to be used, you know, as soon as we get finished wrapping up with it. So I think that really speaks to your level of collaboration, just your level of awareness with stuff going on in the industry and kind of how that can be leveraged to, yeah, to just tell a better story, have a better end result product, because it really does take everybody jumping in. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, I don't care like what level of the industry you're in. It's It very much is kind of like a bartering of favors in a lot of ways, even if it's mm-hmm. like a union commercial rate, you know, it's, it's still going to be a situation where to make the best possible product, you really have to utilize all of your resources and everyone, you know, and everyone, your friends know, and everyone you find online. And now that art has been kind of like democratized online and you have access to all these creators, you know, I think it's a shame for anyone who's not actively like looking at 
people they can work with or people that that might you know fit into their workflow and yeah i remember back then that was like very early days for me that was when i was just transitioning out of visual effects and into directing so i was trying to take this like pretty low budget video and make it feel as as big as humanly possible so i remember just like scrambling and you guys were very much a, a ray of light at that time where like you know some of the other stock packs wouldn't cut it. We didn't have the budget to do pyro. We know that like in order to do this, if we did simulations, especially with our talent range, it wouldn't really look as good. So yeah, mm -hmm. it, it definitely was like a, a ray of hope that we can make this kind of big feeling video on a low end and you guys uh, save the day. So uh, I've, I've been a, a big fan ever since then. <laughs> That's pretty cool to hear. And I always love hearing this type of stories of playing a small role because at the end of the day it's still a small role into that project because everyone involved is still doing the heavy lifting but mm -hmm. yeah that's really cool and i'm glad you brought up the vic mensa thing luke because i had forgotten it was that long ago that was yeah, like was very like very early five or six at least things. what what year was that that came out it's been a minute uh, it also was a video that took a year to come out. There was like yeah, so that's what <laughs> I remember that part because it was like I think we'll see it one day, yeah. and then we just woke up one day and it was so like, it hey, came it's out actually, yeah. four years ago, but we went into production like over five years ago. Yeah, so, yeah, it's been a minute. <laughs> that's that's awesome. crazy. That was definitely very cool to see though, and I feel you know around here in the office, you're definitely known as you know the music video, like all music video director guy because you know all the yeah all the like high profile music videos that have done a great job using our stuff you're always somehow involved and <laughs> always been super impressed but also very inspired by you in general because i used to actually do music videos back in the days so i i kind of see at a much smaller level obviously but but yeah it's always been great to kind of watch you and get you know so many projects and stuff and yeah no music videos are cool it's it's great because you get to do a lot of things really quickly um uh we'll talk about it later i'm sure but I'm, I'm moving into more commercial stuff and, and some film stuff but music videos are always like a nice place because it, it really is just kind of like an open sandbox playground to try stuff out you know it's like mm -hmm. you can literally think of an idea that would be interesting to try and then pitch it on you know several different projects until it works out and then you get to do it so yeah, sometimes it, it'll happen where like I will I will it's it's been like very serendipitous and bizarre where I will think of an idea, and I'll pitch it and we'll book the job, and like in my head I'm like all right so like maybe this is gonna be all 3D and then you guys will come out with a pack, of of like you'll pr like release a trailer it happened on this last one with uh, with Bella Porch and Suburban, where like we had this this shot where like things were gonna burn off and I was like okay this is gonna be a really cool shot I've always wanted to do something like this I just have to like have like, this cool like fiery burn transition and then. <laughs> Literally the day, I think it was the day we were starting post, or like a couple of days beforehand, you guys came out. Like you, I think you emailed me about like the the burning wool pack. Um, so anyway, yeah, the 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 wrap around this conversation is it's it's nice to do music videos because you do get to experiment, and that's definitely opened the door to try a lot of your stuff out. And whenever you guys offer something that's really cool to integrate, music videos are definitely a good spot to do it because there's a you know, a level of experimentation that's allowed, mm -hmm. which is, mm -hmm. is a lot of fun to, to go into. Yeah, that that is really cool. And you'd mentioned kind of your background in VFX before transitioning over into mm -hmm. music videos. Could you talk a little bit about that? And I mean, how did, how does that experience in visual effects kind of interpret or assist in how you are able to direct? Yeah, you know, I think I always like say that coming from VFX, it's made me want to do as little visual effects in my videos as possible because you realize mm -hmm. the limitations <laughs> are possible. But it also means yep. when you do integrate it, it's like you kind of know the limitations. But um, I, I got started pretty early. Like I said, when I was in high school, I would do you know movies with friends and, and movies for school. And I actually learned After Effects from Video Copilot, you know, classic story, just to kind mm -hmm. of amplify all that stuff. I got an internship with like a friend of a friend of my dad's doing some like low level VFX stuff. But when I went to school, I went to NYU to start, I had this kind of like side career kind of growing where I was actively compositing for other students, for, you know, clients of the internship I did that they were passing off to me and it mm -hmm. became like a full-time thing. So, you know, uh, I moved back to Atlanta kind of a couple years later. Uh, I was still, I was like 19 at, the point, at that time and I made some friends in the industry and 
a lot of the people that I had known for a while that were doing small level stuff were starting to do bigger things as Atlanta started to blow up as like a film town. And at that time, like around like 2011, Atlanta had this explosion of industry happen, but all the post stuff hadn't caught up yet. Like all the post was still in LA. There weren't mm-hmm. visual effects supervisors in the city because they'd never needed it. So it's like you have yeah. all these TV shows and movies shooting there for the tax credit and like all these producers that were just doing small commercials and really simple stuff that were suddenly doing TV shows. And then you have these high level, high budget productions, but then the cost of like flying out a VFX supervisor for one day on a shoot and then flying mm-hmm. them back and then paying LA rates and all that stuff was like exorbitant for some of this going on. So I got to slide in, I, I supervised VFX on a Discovery Channel show and a bunch of indie films. And that led to doing stuff on BET. And then, you know, before I was even 21, I was like supervising shows for Adult Swim and commercials and and mm-hmm. some some big music videos. So it was like this like really, really crazy acceleration. And meanwhile, I was, I was directing and writing on the and on the side. But it was it was awesome because I really got to dive deep super young. And the, the best part of it was as a VFX supervisor, you know, there's there's only going to be like an hour or two during the day where like every 100 percent of your focus is needed. The rest of it is just kind of paying attention. And I got to pay attention next to like dozens of high profile directors. Mm -hmm. So it was this really cool thing where I got to almost like shadow these directors without them knowing it because I was just there on set and I was at Video Village and I was supervising VFX and I was this young kid, but I was listening to everything they did and kind of like taking note of every single thing they did, everything from acting exercises to the way they interacted with the producers and the way all that went on. So when I started transitioning to directing, it was like this really, really seamless thing for me because I got to kind of walk into it with the knowledge of how to operate at a dozen different budget levels and a, do- a dozen different kind of levels of, of uh, the industry so mm-hmm. that if I was doing something small or something big, I was I felt like very prepared. So that was great. And then, like I said, VFX, it's like, you know, you fail enough during visual effects and you do enough shots that just don't work that mm-hmm. when you start directing, you have this like massive like mental library of like, okay, if we need to paint that out, this is the best way to shoot it. Okay, if we need to integrate 3D, these are the yeah. three or four assets we need to make this look good. Like you have all of this this kind of background and knowledge to make it happen. And to me, it's like, I don't understand how most directors can operate without understanding the effects to some extent. Because, you know, if it's a million dollar commercial or a $5,000 music video, it's like the client is always going to have requests for like, hey, can we change this? Can we paint this out? Can we move this? You know, there's mm-hmm. always going to be things where on set there's going to be something that goes wrong. And you have to like know what's possible and what's not. And, you know, even just on like a budgetary standpoint, the idea of like not knowing at least a little bit of VFX, I can't imagine because I, I feel like I would go over budget. I would shoot things wrong. All my videos would fall apart. Um, even if it's just as simple as like, how do we make this, you know, this background disappear or how do we make, you know, this character look larger than this other character when they're actually not like those little tiny things that you don't think about, like it's, it's all ties in. So yeah, the, the long answer is VFX have been awesome because I got to study under directors, take that into the filmmaking career. And then on set, I, I feel very comfortable making decisions that would affect the post timeline and I feel like there's never a shoot I've ever had where there isn't some little sprinkle of the effects needed to make something happen, you know? Yeah, that's that's really cool. And it's even more like exciting to hear your age doing that. I think I talk to a lot of people, you know, whether that's like local universities or, or wherever, where it's almost like, hey, whenever I grow up, then I can start getting experience. And like that, while that's something that is often preached, Unfortunately, uh, I think people with just information age, the ability to learn anything you want to do on YouTube, especially in creative fields, I think that's really cool that like you're an example of just jumping in and learning what you can and figuring it out. With mm-hmm. that, though, did you ever find or run into like any resistance of like people not taking you seriously? Because, I mean, you said you were 19 when you are VFX souping yeah, some of these my, shows. My VFX career before I started directing full time was like, you know, if you don't count the high school and college stuff, it was like age 19 to probably 23. Um, 23 was like the last time I supervised someone else's project. So it was like a short career, but it was like I was doing like five or six shoots a month. So it was like very, very dense. But yeah, no, there was there was times I, we, I did this like one BET show. And I'm not going to mention the show or the, the, the name of the people. But yeah, I, it was it was definitely... There was a PM, a, like a, a UPM that I was good friends with that brought me on. And then there was a producer, the line producer of the show I've never met. And I just remember like very distinctly that like the UPM was like super cool, introduced me to the director, everyone was feeling good. 
but then this this one producer just like every chance he got like made my life harder you know it's like would, would question things i said like i'd be mm-hmm. cool i just need to go drop a track marker and he'd be like no 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 like, I was like, no, no, oh my gosh. it's just like he, he assumed I didn't understand the process. So he was like yeah. inhibiting things in the way they go. And there was like three or four. It's been a while now. This was like, you know, almost 10 years ago. But yeah, there were some comments that were made that just like, you know, underhanded, like passive aggressive stuff about mm-hmm. my age and about like, you know, things that more or less the subtext was like, you shouldn't even be here. And so, yeah, there was a handful of those things. But, you know, for the most part, the good news about visual effects is that to most people, people in the industry that don't know it it's like black magic you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so it's like you're like the wizard on set so it's something that people don't understand at all in a lot of cases so if you say i need this or the shot's gonna fail you can kind of leverage that terror (laughs) as much Mm -hmm. as you need to so yeah it's it's definitely difficult when you're young starting out but um i think that you know now that we're in an age where you know any teenager can download Blender and kind of create a world from scratch <laughs> and do things that studios 10 years ago couldn't do with a million dollars. I think that it's mm-hmm. it's like a nice time where the next generation can really leverage their talents and the abilities they've learned and, and show what's possible, you know? Yeah, that's that's really great. And did you, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, you know, Ro and I talk about like, whenever we, you know, had freelance gigs back in the day, being younger, a lot of times it's like, you'd have to flex as you show up Mm-hmm. <laughs> just so everyone's like hey i'm capable and so we would always joke about like loading up all these unnecessary things on our camera rig just so when you pull it out you know it's like oh okay this guy's serious he's <laughs> got with the slr yeah <laughs> especially at that time the slrs like for video that was a bit newer so mm-hmm. most people would be like wait why is this kid here with a photo so camera, camera. <laughs> yeah I remember that too. did you ever lie about your age just to avoid the whole age conversation? Um, I definitely would go out of my way to not talk about it. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. It's funny because like, I remember thinking about it so much when I was 19 and because of situations like that one producer, Yeah. but 99% of the people I met didn't care mm-hmm. about it, but I would like actively think about it and try to hide it. But now, like whenever I, I like, hire on someone who's like 19 or 20, who's like f-ing amazing at what they do, I'm mm-hmm. like stoked. I'm like excited that they're there. And I'm like really curious about like, you know, it's, oh, you know, Unreal Engine using, you're using Unreal Engine 5. Mm-hmm. Like, that's so cool. Yeah. Like, that's way more interesting than like what a lot of my post houses are using. Like, I'm interested in it. And I think that like, it's, it's like refreshing in a way. So yeah, I, I think in hindsight, I probably cared way too much about it. Yeah. Uh, and like went too much out of my way to avoid talking about it when in reality, I think, you know, only 1% of people are going to be jerks mm-hmm. about it, you know? Yeah, it's like, I asked that because that was something I definitely did once or twice back in the days because I did start, you know, freelancing and directing videos when I was 17, actually. And yeah, and yeah, I think first few clients were fine. I did run into one that was just very skeptical of everything. And I think from that, I think I was like 18 at the time. Anytime someone would bring up my age, I would just say I was 23. Mm-hmm. And I was 23 all the way until I was 23. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, I guess that. But yeah, yeah like it really shouldn't matter, but people make a big deal about it. And I think a lot of the people that that put age in that category usually are the ones that aren't doing as well, I feel like. Because mm-hmm. I think every producer I meet and like every production company, they're so interested in finding the young talent that's going to be, you know, burning down the world in a year or two. And that's like a really big thing for them is to find those people. So yeah, I think a lot of the people coming up that really care too much about age are the ones that are very much locked into a box of what their, you know, their capacity creatively mm. is, is, you know, possible to do. It's like they can't relate, right, to yeah. to someone that young being able <laughs> to be that capable. <laughs> right. Tell me about your first, I guess, high profile directing gig. Like how did you land that? Um, high profile in terms of like resources or in terms of, of like, uh, notoriety. Cause I'll, I can give you both, I guess. But I remember, um, you know, I'd done while I was in the middle of, of VFX stuff, I'd actually just done like this micro budget feature film. Uh, I was, I guess I was 21 at the time. I was like actively trying to get into music videos. You know, I had done a couple pseudo music videos or some, some like docu style stuff with artists, but I hadn't like found a pure narrative music video yet. So yeah, one of the first, very, very first ones was, it was literally like a friend recommended me for a job they couldn't do. 
oh, excuse me, a friend recommended me for a job they couldn't do, and it was like a two thousand dollar shoot. But I love the song, and I'm sure everyone that's twenty and trying to get a music video can relate. There's lots of musicians and lots of songs, but most of them are awful, and you know won't go anywhere. So it's like up until that point, every project was just a way to leverage the ability to do stuff creatively, or you know, rent lenses, or try stuff out. Mm-hmm. But never anything that I thought was going to explode. Whereas like this one for Rory was something that was really interesting to me. So they had a couple grand. I ended up paying like I think three thousand dollars of my own money into it. And again, like thank oh. God I was already working full time doing visual effects, or I couldn't do that. But Dang. The video turned out okay, but the song kind of exploded and the video kind of exploded. And that actually got me representation pretty early on, which was great. So after I kind of got that hurdle and like had done my first music video that got a couple hundred thousand views, and I had, you know, agents that were like loosely interested in me. The next big thing was I did four or five small videos that kind of didn't go anywhere after that, you know, which is like the next hurdles. So you're in the industry, you're doing videos, but how do you go from like the five thousand dollar video into like the next tier of things, and that one uh, was a was a bit of luck. I, I would say like the first video that kind of really took it off for me was uh, Skrillex. We did a video for him, and this is back like right in the talent of dubstep being super cool. But he actually called me out of the blue, and it was I remember it was like one of like the most nervous phone calls I've ever been on because I, I was just like very aware that there was a dozen other directors that had been in the industry like ten years on than me that would love to do this video. So. He is one of those people that is always actively looking for like young, hungry creatives that are doing really interesting stuff. And he liked a couple of the videos I did. So he was basically like, you know, I, I have the song. It's almost a year old now, but we want to do a song, you know, a video for it. You know, we, we can't spend more than a hundred grand, but like we have a budget. And like, again, at, to him, you know, most of his videos are a hundred plus and this was a low budget. Yeah. But for me, this was like, oh my God, <laughs> this is like a big opportunity. So uh, the video is called Stranger. And if you watch it, it's it's basically kind of like a reinterpretation of like the Lost Boys, but set in kind of a, a dystopian environment. But it was like we broke so many rules and borrowed and stole and like every favor built that video from the ground up. We. We shot in this like abandoned warehouse space without permits. We did like fireworks and pyro without <laughs> permits. It was Atlanta when right before it kind of got very corporatized video wise. Yeah. So you can get away with a lot. It was like if you knew the chief of police, you could call him and say, hey, I'm just doing a little thing on the street. If you can send an officer, he's like, OK, cool. You know, 30 bucks an hour. Uh, just, you know, just be safe. Like that kind yeah. of thing was still, mm. still possible. So Man. it was like this really cool moment where I got to kind of take every resource available to me in like the local favor exchange and, and put that towards the video and, and do something really, really big to me that, you know, I think that now I would look back and be like, that's insane. Like why, why would I ever try all those things? But it's, it's kind of like what was fun about it and what, what allowed us to do cool stuff. And that led to the Vic Mensa video cause he and Vic Mensa were friends. And then the Vic Mensa video was the, the video that caught like the eye of 21 pilots. They thought that was cool. And it's just been kind of like a roller coaster where, you know, each project leads to two more, which leads to two more, which leads to two more. And then suddenly you're, you know, you're 30 and you're like, what happened in the last eight years? <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, if you can uh, just talk a little bit about your most recent music video with uh, Sir Paul McCartney. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, I've been following along on Instagram and all of that <laughs> up for a VMA right now. And uh, UK MVA, UK, uh, which is something I'm stoked about. It's like the only yes. award show ever since I was just in the industry. I've always loved the UK MVAs because it's the only award show that's voted on like within the industry. Like it's mm-hmm. voted on by directors and producers. And, you know, I have VMAs and that's awesome. I love that. But I've always yeah. wanted the UK MVA because it's kind of mm-hmm. like. It's like the thing that represents your ability within the industry and within the actual yep. creative community, as opposed to just like who's the the most popular artist that did a decent video that year. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's killer. And I, I mean, I did not know that at all. So it's that is an extra special little <laughs> nod in there. So about that video as a whole, like, kind of mm-hmm. what was your experience? Was it? I guess. Do you have any like just initial thoughts? Yeah. So that whole video, yeah, there's there's a million little micro stories I could dig, dig out of it. I mean, the the most important thing is that Paul McCartney was amazing. He was like absolutely hilarious. He was easy to work with. You know, he he only needed to be on set for a quick cameo for like an hour. He was there for like three or four hours and played the piano for us. Uh, oh, it definitely man. was like such a relief that someone that you've grown up with your entire life would be that cool and that easy to talk to. The actual process of it was interesting. So if you've seen the video, we basically kind of recreate a young Paul McCartney. 
And I, I'd done a couple deepfake videos in the past. Like I did a video for the Strokes where you deepfake them to make them look like these creepy clone things. But yeah, with him, it's like we wanted to do a, a photo real recreation of his face. And then we wanted to do it within a music video timeline, which means like you have a month, maybe two months to get this released. Yeah. So it, that that was the roller coaster. It was initially, you know, we were going to have the whole thing be a 3D scan where we de-aged him uh, with a company we were partnering with. And we quickly realized that to do that would take probably six months. Even just like the rendering would take a couple weeks. So it became a thing yeah. of like, well, let's do half deep fake, let's do half 3D. And we, we kind of ended up in this like really interesting hybrid approach where we did kind of a, a baseline deep fake. And if you've done deep fake, you know, you kind of get a resemblance that's there, but it doesn't feel perfectly like them. And then we spent a whole bunch of time doing just like traditional 2D face sculpting on top of it. Like, you know, what you think of as a, a beauty pass, but instead of doing a beauty pass to make someone look more beautiful, you're doing them to look more like Paul McCartney. Mm. So that was kind of the next layer that made it work. And then, uh, you know, we, we kind of colored it with a very vintage sensibility so that we could hide some of the seams, a lot of roto, and then we integrated the 3D face in a few places where it just wasn't possible to deep fake, and then had to get clever. There was, there was a scene at the end where he steps out into this black void, and he's like uplit by all these red lights that we then composited out into this cool kind of uh, psychedelic ripple. But we very quickly realized that the deep fake had no understanding of what to do with an underlit red face. So that became actually a kind of, we wanted like, we didn't want anything to be a compromise. So we're like, all right, what's like even cooler than a deep fake we could do? And we decided to basically rotoscope him out of the scene for 30 straight seconds, head to toe, every, every follicle of his hair, and kind of turn him into this star silhouette. And it, it came out as like one of my favorite parts of the video. So we tried to, you know, really push what was possible with deep fake and kind of a face translation. And using every every trick we had and then where where it fell apart we tried to build that creatively in a way that made sense and made it made it functional and not just a uh, a band-aid you know so yeah very happy with that came out paul was mm -hmm. amazing uh i feel like super lucky to have been a part of that and uh i'm i'm stoked that people like the video hey congrats man i'm rooting for you for oh, thank you for that award <laughs> and I do love how you mentioned. Yeah, I have some VMAs, like no big deal. <laughs> yeah, no, they're great. I'm, I'm like super, super honored to have them. But it's, it's, uh, you always like wonder. I don't know if this is everybody, but because there's like the voting end, you always wonder like, would I get the award if they didn't just have a large fan base? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So there's always like that question. So, you know, win or lose on the the VMAs, it's always nice to be be nominated there because it, it just means that. Um, you're doing a, a service not just to the fans, but also to the creatives and the other industry folks that like are doing the same thing as you and think what you're doing is, is you know, the right direction. Yeah. And it's not just one nomination, right? <laughs> it's two. Yeah. <laughs> it's two. Yeah. I didn't want to didn't want to just uh, gloss over that one as well. So, yeah. Build yeah, a bit. Um, I don't know what the censoring on this podcast is. Build a <laughs> we'll, by we'll, fig Ford, we'll figure it out later. <laughs> is also up. Um, which is really cool because that was mm -hmm. that was one that was like a, a really risky video and we tried a lot of crazy stuff and I'm, I'm really happy with that one that came out as well. So it's it's cool to see both of them kind of shining. It's been a it's been a fun mm -hmm. year for sure. Yeah, I mean you've been. It seems like that one and uh, Inferno was just back to back. Were were they filmed pretty closely together or was it based on kind of the performance of the first one that prompted the yeah, second? Yeah, uh, I mean we we finished uh, Bill to Be. Um, and yeah, it, it did like 200 million views in the first mm -hmm. month and a couple days and some change. But the label, as you can expect, they were like very stoked and the management was very stoked and she was very stoked yeah. at how well it was doing. So, of course, instead of it being like, you did one great video, let's make sure we have extra time and extra resources on this next one. It was kind of right the opposite, which was like, OK, we have to shoot the next one like now. We have to, we have to go for <laughs> it while the, the yeah. iron is hot. So it, I definitely wish that one had like a little bit more prep time and a little bit more post time, but it's it was it was cool to kind of do them somewhat back to back. I think they were like the mm -hmm. shoot dates were like a month month and a half apart, and yeah, uh, it's it's cool to to work with someone who's like I always like working with new artists that kind of are, are learning what they like and what they don't like early on because I get to be a part of that conversation. So it's it's definitely been like great to to be a part of her team and, and kind of work with her in suburban and building things from the ground up, uh, and then and then seeing them successful, you know, because. Sometimes, you know, you'll have an artist that it's like, here's our color palette, here's what he's wearing, or she, you know, here's the, the backgrounds they want to do. It feels very kind of constructed, whereas with mm -hmm. Bella and a lot of new artists, it's, it just feels like everything is like open canvas, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is 
a really good point too because i feel like even with your specific directing style regardless of the artist it's like you kind of have your trademark themes where they all feel connected in a way uh is that i mean can you speak to that a little bit maybe uh just the team that you work with as far as grading and that type of thing i, I feel yeah. like there's a lot that goes into it yeah i mean i think you know as as with like a lot of directors it's the more videos that you do the more you're like i like this i don't like this i like this i don't like mm-hmm. this and i think like to the outside world it seems like you have like this like you know list of sensibilities that are your style but it really is just like I, I know what I like. And I know what I don't like now. So there's yeah. there's lenses I like. There's lenses I don't like. There's there's lighting schemes I like. There's lighting schemes I don't like. You know when I when I'm in the color grade, even though we use a different colorist on, on most projects, just because colorists are always like crazy booked all the time. And mm-hmm. music videos, you don't know what day you're coloring until you're green lit to go. And then when you're green lit to go, you have two days to deliver the video. So it's always a little hectic. So yeah, it's it's I think it's just a matter of the more videos you do the more obvious it becomes what you like and don't like. Mm-hmm. I kind of liken it to like when you go to like the eye doctor for glasses, if you've ever done that, it's like option A, option B, option A, option B. If they just showed you like the before and after, you know, bad vision to good vision, you, you have no idea like if it was just a little bit too sharp or a little bit too soft, you wouldn't know for sure like if this was the best possible. But when you break mm-hmm. it down in like 20, 30 steps and you try them all side by side, it, it becomes a lot easier to know what you like and don't like. So directing, especially in the music video, and is kind of the same way, where it's like, you know, you know, you have, have a camera, you choose what you like and don't like. You, you have the lenses, you know what you like and don't like. You have color palettes, you know, you know what you like and don't like. And then once it kind of all starts to kind of come together into a storm of, of what the final product is, it's like, yeah, that, that, that feels like an Andrew Donahoe video, but it's just because, you know, it's like, I I like spicy food and not not bland food. And I like I like my my steak salty and and I don't like, uh, you know, lime juice on salad. It's the same as anything else, you know? Makes sense. And one thing that I really love that you mentioned and touched on was the fact that, you know, in your directing career, the fact that, you know, you know, so much about the different, you know, fields of the art, like visual effects, cinematography and all of that, how that contributes to helping you essentially manage the, job better and do a better job because you see like the whole picture so to speak but it's like with you know filmmaking and i love that you are a director you know with that being such a collaborative art do you ever find it or did you ever find it hard to make that transition like do you ever feel like maybe knowing too much could be a disadvantage in the sense that it's harder to trust someone else to to let go because you know, if if you if you know how to shoot and you know enough about vi- visual effects, it can be very hard to just let go and let someone else do it. You, you could feel like, hey, well, I can just do it myself. So, speak a little bit on that. Like, how do you find the balance? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, as, as I'm sure you know too, it's like if if you come from videography, which I did plenty of at the the same time I was doing visual effects stuff, is like you start to see what works and doesn't work. It, I think it makes you better at choosing people you know it's because you know i had dp'd some stuff before i can tell when a dp is actually lighting a scene from scratch and making it look gorgeous versus someone who just had a very lucky sunset with a very lucky sky pattern and you know a very expensive set of lenses you know what i mean you can start to see sort of when you're watching other people's work and building your crew you can sort of see what makes up the dna of those people so i think that it helps you curate your list of people because you know, you can be a totally green director that's never done anything and, and just be like, that's cool, hire him, that's cool, hire her, that's cool, hire him. But I think it's something totally different to know why you're hiring these people and why you think what they do is cool. And visual effects too, it's like, you know, it's if you look at a really amazing compositor reel, but you realize that there's there's no fully 3D renders in there, you're not going to hire that person to be the guy that builds a mountain range from scratch, you know? Mm-hmm. And same thing if you hire an amazing 3D guy, but you realize all of the work uh, on his or her reel is is just like hard body, no animated, no physics. And you're not going to use them to be, create a creature that you know moves around. So mm-hmm. the same is true of, of production designers, of of prop masters, of stylists, of, of pretty much every role on the crew. Is you know the more you can know and learn about their skill set, and the more you can kind of dig into their world, the better you will be at curating people. And then honestly, the the the, the biggest pet peeve I had kind of getting started was was directors that would like hire a really amazing editor and then they wouldn't like the first cut they'd fire him or her or directors mm-hmm. that would hire an amazing dp 
and then they weren't super stoked on what they were getting and then they wouldn't use that person ever again without realizing that it wasn't that person or that person's skill set. It was just that you weren't putting the right puzzle piece in the right part of the jigsaw puzzle. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to learn you know, as much as you can about your crew skill sets and, and why that's important and, you know, use it to curate your team in a way where everyone in their respective roles is better than you would be in that role. And then, you know, there, there have definitely been times where just because of budget or because of time, you know, this is the one place it does shoot you in the foot is you won't be able to hire someone or you won't have the money to hire someone or the time to hire someone that represents the skill set you want. And then, yes, there, there are dozens of jobs where, I've had to do half the VFX myself because I, I, I saw, you know, it just wasn't quite coming together or, mm -hmm. you know, jobs where, you know, I would be my own second unit DP or, or times where I would like dictate the lens length and very specific settings on the camera because I could see the DP wasn't quite clicking with what I wanted. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of times like that where you do have to step in and it always gets a little bit awkward, but you know, I'm hoping, and I think this is the case so far, the further you get along, you know, beyond just bigger budget projects, beyond just cooler projects, the, the freedom that you get as you get more experience is the biggest thing, which is like, I'm hoping to get to a place where I never have to compromise on any crew member and that I'm always hiring people that I think are not only great at what they do, but people I like to work with that have a good attitude and, you know, mm -hmm. kind of all those kind of checklist things so that, you know, when I'm doing movies or when I'm doing, you know, bigger projects down the line, one day it will all be, you know, the dream team with just people mm -hmm. you enjoy working with and you like going to work and you have faith in everyone around you. So I think that yep. that's music, like the goal. And I think that's, the goal for a lot of directors is, is just to, to be surrounded by people you trust, you know? Yeah, that, because as you mentioned, like even as a job or as a career, like those are the people that you work with. And most jobs you spend more time with the people you work with than you do with your family, depending yeah. on just like work situations and things like that. But as you had mentioned, kind of transitioning into films and other commercial work, what's what's kind of your next trajectory of what you're wanting to eventually uh, work on? Yeah, um, I think for me, it's just like, uh, I had a, a DP that said something really cool. Uh, his name was, he's a German DP named uh, Jian. And he, uh, we were doing a, a shot on this music video, this like five or six years ago, where he had told me over and over again, like he didn't like using long lenses. And then we got into a situation where we needed to do a long lens, you know, because we wanted the video to feel very close to the subject. And he said something that was really, really cool. I don't remember it verbatim, but he basically said, like, you know, I, I will always serve the story and I'll always serve the project. So I just have to try my best to choose projects that me serving them will also be serving my own interests. Because kind of once you get into a project, you're handing yourself over to it. So for me, the trajectory is I want to get more projects where you know, I always want to serve the project and make the best possible version of that video or commercial or movie when I'm in it. But I'm trying to get music videos that only represent the things that I like to make and like the stories I like to tell. And then same thing with commercials and movies. And I just joined a new production company for commercials that's been super awesome called Tomorrow. Uh, we just did a, a I think I'm I think I'm fine to talk about it. We just did a spot for like Lou Lemon and Mirror. That's pretty cool. That I'm excited to show. Um, and we have a couple other spots in the works. And then there's a, a film I'm attached to for the spring. You know, it's it's a smaller budget one that we're still putting the pieces together. And as with any film, it could change or push or, or fall apart. But I'm excited about that. So for me, it's I just want to tell more stories and I want to kind of do more interesting and, and bigger concepts. And it's not so much about the size or the people or the type of work. It's just I want to tell more stories that are, are things that I, I'm passionate about and care about and doing my best to do that this next couple months yeah that is really cool and you know it's like even the video medium just being able to kind of say hey whether it's a film whether you know feature length short film music video i have a lot of respect for that because it is the craft of the storytelling and the art and inside of each medium you have all of these subcategories and different ways that you can explore that you can't in the others uh, just right. by the nature of what they are so that's that's really cool. Yeah, and commercials have always been like a weird thing for me because when you're when serving the story means serving the brand, it's a lot harder to find those things mm -hmm. to sink your teeth into. So I've I've done like, you know, several, you know, campaigns and national broadcasting stuff, but it's not anything I really put out there to be like, look, this is my work and this is like, you know, what I want to continue doing because a lot of times it yeah. ends up not being. But finally, I feel like I've I've sort of gotten that threshold where I'm I, my music videos are translating into commercials. And I'm getting the commercials that I want to do, not just, 
you know, have to do for money and the commercials then have the resources to do bigger concepts. So yeah, that would be the, uh, the hope is that as I dive into commercials that I can, I can do so and continue making concepts I think are interesting and unique and Mm -hmm. kind of meaty for me, even if they're selling a product, but then also have the resources to try new things and and kind of dig deeper into the, the, the storytelling aspect of things too. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So kind of as we wrap up here, what would be one piece of advice, maybe a couple of different things for someone kind of aspiring to follow your same career path loosely as far yeah. as getting in the industry, directing, maybe it's music videos or anything of the like? I think in general, again, if we're talking about looking back to the, the things we thought when we were young, it's not a competition. And I think that the sooner you realize that there's like so much work out there and so many different types of work out there for everybody that even if you're pitching against other people, it's they're all your peers and they're all going through the same struggles as you. Some of my favorite jobs have come from other directors you know, that I'm friends with. You know, I've had my life saved by crew members that could have very easily just said like, you know, that's, I'm not getting paid for that, so I'm not gonna do that. I've, I, I think that the more collaborative and inclusive you can make your work and your workflow, the better it's gonna be. Uh, and I think whenever you're in a headspace of like, oh, they took my job or oh, like, you know, I want to, you know, looking at what the other person's doing, wishing that was yours, or in any way thinking that you've somehow surpassed someone or that there's someone you're like trying to get past, all that mm-hmm. stuff, honestly, it just like slows you down. And I think that the sooner you get rid of those, those kind of impulses and the sooner you realize it's not a competition, that we're all in this together, and that it is a community, like the better you'll do. And there's always going to be people that they don't want to be a part of your community, and that's fine. You know, you don't have to work with them, you don't have to interact with them, but it's, it's like the, the competitive rat race element of it makes a very difficult, very emotional job just way worse and way harder. So yeah, I just, I would say I just on an emotional level, this is a very hard career path. And it's like you said, the people you work with are like your family and the other people in the industry, are the ones that are your peers. And you know, you have to do this every day. So if you're doing it mm-hmm. and you feel jealous and angry and frustrated all the time, it's like kind of quelling those, those impulses are, will be what let you do better work and continue doing more stuff. And honestly, it make you a better creative because the more you compare your stuff to other people or like, oh, they stole my idea or like, oh, like I could do that shot better than them. Like the more you, you deal with all those elements, the, the more repetitive and, you know, unoriginal your work's going to be. So, uh, yeah, the, the short answer of that is, you know, be inclusive, see this as a community, you know, do whatever you need to do to enjoy going to work every day and, and don't make it. A, a more difficult job than it already is, you know? Yeah, that's, that is honestly some killer advice. Like I think even someone in their career already, you know, a seasoned vet or whatever can take a lot from that because there's a lot of truth to that of trying to make the environment around you as best it can be and just building other people up and trying to position them to succeed. And that just helps you in return. Um, so that's, That's really cool and really inspiring. I think a lot of people will find that advice and kind of the other things that we've talked about really encouraging and hopefully help provide some more uh, clarity around those types of things. Glad to hear it. Yeah, I remember specifically when I was young, I I remember early 20s getting frustrated when I see certain people book big jobs. And yeah, that, (laughs) that did like nothing but make me have writer's block and make me worse at writing and make me feel like every time I was putting together a treatment or an idea or a script that I had to like one up someone. And yeah, Mm -hmm. I I just work so much quicker now and my ideas are so much fresher and kind of uh, from a much better place now that I'm not thinking about other people's work. So yeah, get that out of your system as fast as you can. That's a great mindset and definitely very great advice that, yeah, as the goal saying, anyone can really benefit from that (laughs) because it's not like the whole, you know, winners, well, losers focus on winners and winners focus on winning. I've heard that before. <laughs> and that's kind of right. it. Just, just do your thing and don't worry yeah. about what anyone, else, what anyone and, else is doing. Totally. And in this like social media age where everything is like, you know, only presenting a certain version of it. It's, it's even outside of work. It's just easy to compare yourself or think about your life through mm-hmm. a lens that's not healthy. And that doesn't benefit anybody, not even yourself, you know? Yeah, that's... Some really good insight. And uh, Andrew, I'm extremely excited to have been able to kind of see your growth all the way from Vic Mensa days uh, through, you know, 21 Pilots, uh, Suburban, Bella Porch, all of these 
awesome artists that you've had the chance of working with. And it's just really cool to see that iteration of your craft and your career as the years have gone by. And really excited to kind of see this next stretch for you as well, you know, moving more into feature films and some other types of work. Uh, so thank you so much for carving out some time to chat with us on this episode of Ask an Artist. Yeah, you guys as well. You guys are killing it right now. It's uh, it's like so exciting to see how big the library is and all the places it's getting used. Like I remember, it like very early on, you know, it was you'd see a couple projects here and there that's using it, but now it's like you know, tons of giant movies and video games and, <laughs> and all these huge projects all using your assets and and rightfully so because there's there's nothing else like it online, especially if you're into action movies and explosions it's uh it's hard to find find better stuff i want to i want to come to set next time you guys are doing pyro stuff please invite yes. me yes <laughs> yes we have a flamethrower i'll come out <laughs> yeah it's not that I'm far up, from Atlanta. Over, man. yeah so that would be sick that would be super fun we need to just have a field day where we invite all of our uh like podcast guests to, <laughs> to show up and we'll just do a a big round table episode with everybody where we all blow things up and Shoot the flamethrower. We'll that would be you fine, push right? The red button. Yeah, red button. <laughs> great, great. Awesome, Andrew. Thanks so much. Hope you have a great rest of your day. And of course. Thanks for having me. We will you see you next well. time on Ask an Artist. Sounds good. Thank you. Peace.